All right, good evening everyone and welcome to Café Scientifique for the first time um, this academic year. We're really glad to be back at Hermann's, we're really glad they're having us back. Thanks also to the Faculty of Science who sponsor this event. My name is Scott McIndo. Um, John Willis used to do this and to fill his considerable shoes since he stepped down, three of us have stepped up. Um, <laughs> Myself, uh, Toby, who's speaking tonight, and Jen Cobb, who's over there, wave for us, Jen, um, is, the, is the, the third of the committee that's going to be hosting these. Jen is actually speaking in a month's time, in early December, um, on the topic of the Fountain of Youth. So I am very much looking forward to that talk, because with the ad advent of virtual teaching, I've had to see myself teach on camera, and I couldn't help thinking that that guy could use a long drink from a fountain of youth. <laughs> anyway, tonight um, our speaker is Tobias Junginger, who is an assistant professor um, at the University of Victoria in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, and he also has an adjunct position at Triumph. He is an expert in accelerator physics, and superconductivity, and he's going to be talking to us tonight about the wonders of superconductivity. So with no, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Toby. Please join with me in welcoming him. Okay, so can you hear me well? Everybody, excellent. Okay, great. So finally, I tried to speak here. It's for the third time I tried to speak here. The first time was in February 2020, and... <laughs> No, it was not cancelled because of COVID. It was actually snow. It was actually snow in Victoria. 2020, okay, that was my first try. February 2020, and then we couldn't, um, yeah. Then we couldn't rebook um, uh, due to COVID. Lucky, uh, very happy to be here, finally. So it still took me a while. And okay, these talks were about particle accelerators, which I planned, but okay, it's a bad omen, so I'm not talking about partic particle accelerators today in the end a little bit. Yes, okay, today I'm talking about superconductivity. So what I research is superconductivity for particle accelerators. So specifically, I am working with these devices. Anybody has an idea what this is? All right, I'll come back later to that. It's a resonator in the end. Yeah? Okay, so this is what we use in particle accelerator. It is made out of a superconductor. And okay, it's a Mr. Oss radio frequency. Okay, I'll come to that. I hope at the end of the talk you will have an idea uh, what I do with that. This is what my research is about. But uh, yeah, let's start from the very basics and let's go back 100 years in history, um, maybe further, and um, go to a time where superconductivity did, uh, was not discovered yet. Okay. Okay. So when we talk about superconductivity, we first think about what is what is a conductor. What is a good conductor? So what do you use? What materials do you use to conduct electricity? Our copper. Okay. So I got a copper wire here, and on my other hand, I have a superconductor. Okay. Can you see the superconductor? Okay. Right. So which one of these two can carry more current? Our left one, which is a very, I mean, it's copper, right? Copper is one of the very best conductors, not the very best on conductors, but I, this is a superconductor. And actually, they can carry the same amount of current, this little wire here. So how do they do that? How was it discovered? This is um, uh, what I like to start my talk about. So it's copper wire. So what happens when I transport, well, if I want to transport energy through that, well, it goes through a current, electrons, yeah? So electrons move through that. So what happens? And if I try to push more and more electrons through this, um, uh, this wire, basically more current, what's going to happen? It's going to, it's going to heat up, yeah. Why is it going to heat up? What's the reason for that? What's happening in there? What you say? Resistance. Has a resistance. What is resistance? It's in the end of the day. It is the electrons, they move there, and they are scattering off the atoms in there. So that thing, it looks still, right? I'm not moving, okay, I mean, my hand is shaking a little bit, I'm a bit nervous, okay, fair enough. But I mean, okay, that thing is not moving, all right, we see. But if you look at it on a very, very small scale, if you look at the atoms itself, you will see that thing is a 
basically shaking around all the time. And then the electron try to go through there. So what's going to happen? Eventually they're going to hit. What's going to happen? They hit. Okay, it's a collision. It, it heats up. Okay, so what you do when you want more and more, when you want to transport more and more energy, you see like um, a big um, uh, yeah, power station, something. Okay, it's huge cables. You just use big copper cables. So, yeah, so you need more to get more solar. The other option is, okay, use a superconductor. Okay, so. Okay. 1900. We did. People did not know that this phenomenon of, super, phenomenon of superconductivity exists. So I was thinking about, well, what happens when I cool this down? So basically you cool copper wires for, 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 for two reasons. Mostly, I mean, okay, because it heats up, you basically carry away the heat. But let's talk about the resistance itself, like how much scattering you have. This is also affected. Because I thought like everything is moving in here. What happens if I go colder and colder? Less is moving. So what's going to, what, is, what do you expect happening then? And make it colder and colder. That's so what people like around 1900, people were, were asking themselves this question. And so, I, well, there was one school of people who said, okay, sure. If I go to absolute zero temperature, which is minus 273, degrees Celsius, what is going to happen? Yeah, okay, so then nothing moves and the electron can move freely through that. But, and somebody said, okay, wait. But okay, the atoms are not moving, but the electrons are not moving either. So that thing is going to become an insulator. Unfortunately, in the 19, um, uh, around that time, we didn't have the technology really to, to that because you need very, you need coolant. How do you cool things down? Well, you can use dry ice, which is basically um, solid um, CO2. Then you can use liquid, uh, liquid nitrogen, minus 200. That gets you pretty far down. But the real the breakthrough came with um, liquefying helium. So how cold is helium? This is 4 degrees Celsius above absolutely zero, or minus 269 degrees, uh, degrees Celsius. And so then people were cooling down these... Um, well, that's what happened. Well, it didn't really reach quite zero. Yeah, it kind of it didn't also not go up, it just remained at a final thing. And they were trying. I said, okay, good, fine. Maybe it's just okay, there's some impurities in there. Maybe that's the reason. So they tried to make things purer and purer. And saying, okay, but and so like, aha, okay, good. So the purer the material it is, the better it becomes. So okay, if it's perfectly pure. It's a perfect metal, it should go to zero. Okay, but how do you get um, a copper very pure? Honestly, I don't know. It was okay, and then it doesn't matter, so you turn the light. But what I know is for a liquid, it's much easier. A liquid, you can easier purify distillation. So what materials I decided to, to check on it was um, mercury. Mercury, okay, you might know, it's like you have it in, uh, we used to have it in thermometers, it's still used to, in some countries to, to make dental implants. It's not like it's going in a teeth, but it's used to, to make them in the process. Right, mercury. Mercury is your distillation, make it very pure. And now they measured the resistance, uh, resistance of mercury, cooled it down, and right at 4 Kelvin, where um, uh, the temperature of the liquid helium, like once mercury reached that temperature, something strange happened. Suddenly the resistance went to zero, but not gradual. The prediction was you go gradual, yeah? but it was a jump, like a phase transition. How we call that? Like a switch, if you want. So it suddenly got zero resistance. So what people thought, like, yeah, yeah, okay, that's a measurement mistake. So of course, I mean, you see something like that, nah, you got a shortcut somewhere, system has some, uh, has some issues. Usually, okay, scientists, we find something which is totally, well, against what um, we expect. It's exciting. But first of all, you think like, oh, okay, you gotta be very cautious about that. Okay, um, false claims have been made. Um, yeah, false claims have been made, maybe can you ask? Have people um, read about um, room temperature superconductivity? It was like in, uh, I think in, in summer this year. Have you followed that? There were some claims about that? Anybody? Okay, right, I'll talk about that later. Huh? But I mean here, okay, this one, okay, again, was something really unexpected, but 
it prevailed. They kept on testing and realized, okay, yes, this is something really new. And it turns out it doesn't really depend so much on purity. Later on, other materials were discovered. It included, um, yeah, also metals. Lead was really discovered. Tin was some, uh, tin is one of them. Copper, by the way, is not a superconductor. One of the very best conductors, but this is not a superconductor unless I put it um, uh, under pressures which are um, basically as, as big as you have in the core of the earth. So you have to really press it very hard to become a superconductor. It's really no application of a superconductor at all. So this was in 1911 when it was discovered, but people did not people understood. Yeah, okay. Were um, uh, interesting phenomenon, but they didn't know. Under, they didn't really understand why, and it took almost 50 years, 1957 to be precise, to find out uh, to have a really a theory what is going on. So why do you suddenly reach zero resistance? So and it turned out that is an attractive interaction between electrons, which only happens at very low temperatures. So you have two electrons, same charge. Well, they would repel each other, right? But at very low temperature, everything around, the atoms are moving less, they can basically talk to each other. It's actually over, okay, the distance is somewhat large on atomic scale. So they talk over each other over a couple of hundred atoms apart, but they create an attractive interaction. Okay, sure, we got, okay, now we got two electrons paired. Well, why do we get to the resistance from that? Because to break them up again, it needs energy. And that energy, you know, to break them up, is less. It's more, excuse me, of course, more than what they would lose in a scattering process. Well, that means they just move around without any resistance. No scattering, no resistance, superconductivity. So we have now, yeah, well, now we have, can transport current, we can transport electricity without any heat generated without any resistance. All right. So what can you do with that? So the idea was then to build a magnet. High power magnets, okay, so how do you make, how do you make a magnet? Basically, so you take a wire and you just turn it, all right? Like that, and basically now I got a magnet. Okay, not a very strong one like that, but that's how you build a magnet. And you see like already why superconductivity is so great for building magnets, right? I mean, okay. So you need a lot of, to have a strong magnetic field, you need a lot of these windings, a lot of turns, and you need to transport a lot of current. And since, okay, this is so much smaller than that one, I can make much easier high field magnets. And this was where people had tried, but unfortunately, what happened is, you checked how much current I get through that, and afterwards you do like that. And, it, and if I start winding that, the current I get through there is 10 times lower. That's weird, all right? all right? Okay, just like that, okay, and this is just winded. What is, what is happening? And people said, yeah, 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 okay, it's probably some mistake with other things, like we, can, we should be able to do that. No, it's very fundamental. So like these superconductors, okay, that one is actually okay, but let me come later to that. But like the superconductors we knew at that time, like elements, yeah, lead or niobium. It's actually niobium pure. So basically, um, uh, my research is still um, uh, in the 1900s. I come later to that. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> okay. So, but only a very small fraction of the current is about a factor of 10. If you're starting to wind, what actually happened is you wants to create a magnetic field, but superconductors don't like magnetic fields. So it's like, okay, great, excellent. So okay, so it seems like, okay, good, sure. Okay, not going to work. Got a little bit disappointed by, people got disappointed by that. Right, so yeah, actually this demonstration, I'll show you if you ever seen a superconductor floating um, uh, on, t or a magnet floating on top of a superconductor. I sometimes do this in demonstrations at um, some events such as yeah, Science Rendezvous or so at UVic. So it's actually pretty cool. I mean, really, you, you put a magnet on top of a superconductor and then you cool it down. Or you need, to, yeah, and it becomes superconducting. We call it critical temperature where this is happening. What's going to happen? The magnet is really being pushed up. 
Why a lot? Because the superconductor really doesn't like the magnetic field. Just so, okay, get away. Oh. All right? But fortunately, in the 1950s, 1960s is when uh, basically things changed a bit. Huh? So this wire here is niobium titanium. Okay, a different type of superconductor. And here, in these type of superconductors, there's a sort of a coexistence cell, it's like a magnetic field, but it found a way to coexist. So in a way, some magnetic field gets in, and you can actually build high field magnets around there. So this is now, nowadays, allows us to build is these um, superconductors in 1950, 1960s, so it took about 40, 50 years from since the discovery before we had really the technology to build magnets, strong magnets. So what can you do with these strong magnets? So I have a couple, uh, I have a couple of examples. So one thing is, So one thing is, for example, a particle accelerator. In a particle, I work in particle accelerators. So I some different things, so not, not on magnets. But for example, the LHC, the largest particle accelerator, 27 kilometers. It's in the end of the day what it is. It's basically a 27 kilometer ring filled with superconducting magnets, basically. And what do the superconducting magnets do? They don't accelerate at all. They just keep the particles, make sure they come back. And you need very strong fields. The more energy you put in there, it's harder to keep them on track. So this is the largest installation okay, I have. But something which is maybe uh, a little bit, you might have seen is MRI magnets. MRI, the technology of MRI is really reliant on uh, superconductivity. You won't be able to get these fields all the way. So this um, uh, was enabled by that. Another thing would be fusion. In the end of a fusion and particle accelerators are somewhat similar. In both cases, we have charged particles which we keep on a certain track. That's uh, okay. We you know, it's somewhat similar the technology, the, um, the technologies in case of, in case of the uh, magnetic fields you generate. Another thing, as I said, that superconductors they don't like magnetic fields, but you can actually use that a magnetic levitation train. So that can actually go if you superconductors. They demonstrate it can go 600 kilometers per hour. Well, uh, so this is uh, the fastest trains because you don't have any bearings, you don't have any friction. He goes, okay, superconductor doesn't like the magnet. Pulls the train up, and now you have a frictionless transport. All right. So now the um, talk a bit about the MRI again. So the MRI, so what do you think? You think you need a large power supply? I mean, every electrical circuit has a power supply, right? So in your household, okay, sure, I mean, it's in the end, it's a power plant. Or a car, something to battery. I mean, it's a power supply. So you need, I think you need a you need a large power supply for an MRI. It's a huge magnet, huh? Is you go on the magnet and there? No, there's no power supply actually. An MRI magnet in an hospital it does not have a power supply. So how does it work? So okay, very well. Okay, you, you as soon okay as the thing is installed, of course you need a power supply. You need to establish the field. You need to ramp. It. We call it ramp it up. So you turn it on, but after the field is established, so pretty much what I do is I, I, I short circuit my power supply. Now what that means basically I put a superconducting wire over it. Obviously I cannot just go inside there and um, work in the four uh, uh, degrees Celsius above zero and show something. No. But the interesting thing is, of course, I mean, this thing is only superconducting uh, at a certain temperature. In this case, it's um, 10 degrees Celsius above absolute zero. So what I do is I keep it warm. I keep that thing warm, so and then okay, then the power supply is running. And as soon as I have my field established, I just switch the power supply off. And of course, I don't leave it there. It's a waste, okay. can use it for the next one. It goes out. In this case, it's in persistent mode. So the current just keeps on. So how long does it flow, the current? Oh, it's super good. Forever, yeah, because zero resistance. There's nothing is going to scatter, yeah? So this is forever. Basically, you have a permanent magnet. So does it mean we need zero energy to run that? No, cooling, right? So you need liquid helium to cool it, unfortunately. So like this is uh, running a uh, critical temperature, uh, it's 9, nine 10 Kelvin. Uh, yeah, so we still need that. So what would be the way out of that? Room temperature superconductivity. So basically, you have a room temperature superconductivity. You basically would have a permanent magnet then. Uh, you would do the same thing, power it up, and then short circuit everything at room temperature. But unfortunately, 
as far as we know, there so far there is no room temperature superconductor. Yeah, so it hasn't been discovered. There had been some claims so where people measured some so like a resistance drop and say, okay, and zinc. But at the end of the day, so far, we haven't won. How close are we? Well, we are in the regime where we, um, I think, m minus 135 degrees Celsius is the, is the world record under ambient pressure. If you put very high pressure, you can even go a little bit lower, but even then you don't reach, um, uh, you don't reach a room temperature. Well, I mean, it is a big game changer still because I said, okay, like um, everything is being cooled by liquid helium. But what can you use when you're basically in a regime for 130, 130 or two more? You can lose liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen is a much easier to handle as a coolant. It's abundant in the air, 80%. Helium, okay, helium is, um, uh, is a very limited resource. It's, and so, and also, like it, it's a lot easier. The cryogenics, okay. I could bring in liquid nitrogen here, and mess around with that and show some demonstration. No way I could do that with uh, with helium. I think you would all need a very sophisticated system with vacuum insulation and so on and so forth. Like, okay, really couldn't mess around with that. So, and liquid nitrogen easy to handle. But so why? Okay, but uh, and I, I tell I told you, okay, basically we're using that neon titanium. So why don't we use these high temperature superconductors? Like it's covered in 1986, and then okay, it got the Nobel Prize actually pretty quickly. I don't know, okay, um, a couple of years afterwards. No, it often takes very long. So, but why not? Why not using that? Well, unfortunately, it's ceramics. If you got a, um, one thing is why these wires are so great. Is sure, okay, they can go high magnetic fields, but also it's a material you can actually make wires out of it. It's not so easy with ceramic. Yeah, you can do some tapes and straight lines. You can use it for. You can do some things with that, but it's limited, unfortunately. So this is a stage where we are. Um, but okay, you probably want to know, um, does room temperature superconductivity exist? Will we ever have it? Well, what do you think? I mean, I could hear, I could, um, I could ask. How many people think a room temperature superconductor uh, conductor will exist at some point? Okay, I think it will be fine to found eventually. Okay, 50 or years. 50 years? 15? 15 years. 15 years? Oh, Peter, okay, do I get a promotion if I find it? <laughs> All right, great. All right, okay, unfortunately, not really that reaction. <laughs> uh, yeah, not going to happen. Okay, so 15 years, okay, good. Okay, but how many people think it will never happen? Just doesn't exist, not going to work. Oh, oh okay. Uh, okay, so a pessimistic crowd. Okay, good. I mean, I, I think it's hard to tell. Right, okay, so. Let's ask you another question. How many people think there is life on another planet? Ooh, okay. So how people how people think it's not? Seriously? So more people think there's no room temperature superconductor than they think, okay, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> All right. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, I say a bullet. But okay, good. All right, so, um, okay, whatever you want to hear my opinion. My opinion uh, is yes to both. I think both exists. For life on Earth, okay, like usually, uh, out of Earth, you think it's okay, you got so many planets and um, uh, um, the chance, okay, there's something going on. Yeah, okay. No. Good. For superconductors, my argument is that. So, how many elements do we have? Periodic um, table, it's 118, some of them are not stable, and we know which are superconducting, yeah? Of course, it's easy. Okay, you take one at a time, you test them. Okay, we don't know if the very unstable ones are superconducting, but you don't really care if, it, if it's like um, existing for a fraction of a second and things like, okay, no, it's not going to help. Want to be practical here. So, but how many compounds, how many different uh, materials can you synthesize, something like that? I don't really know. I mean, okay, I see the chemist over there, he can tell you, but I know, I just know it's a lot. And, um, and even if you mix two things, it's not necessarily the same thing. So you got basically a wide, wide range of materials. So it was really a, um, like 1986 that this was called cuprates were discovered. I mean, that came out of man, it came a little bit uh, out of nowhere. So yeah, I mean, I don't see any reason. Nobody came up with an argument really. Why not? I think like okay, yeah, it's going to happen. Well. 
Good. Whether it is then something which is really useful, whether it's okay, whether it can be made into wire, and we will see. But what would it? Well, let's just think about. It. We would have it. What could we use it for? Why would it be a game changer? So, fusion. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fusion. You could make a fusion reactor even more easily. You don't like um, uh, you easier. Um, you come easier to the point where you get more energy in and out because you don't need the. Huh? It's a cooling, yeah, absolutely. Fusion is a good one. Um, basically, everything where you use some, where you use basically superconducting magnets right now, absolutely. One thing I think about where it would really make a, make a lot of sense is okay. Come back to the magnetic levitation train. So now the magnetic levitation train, good. Room temperature superconductor, basically no um, uh, no energy. Now we levitate, and um, now if you go crazy about it, then the next thing is. You put it in a vacuum tube. Okay, good. You need to run some vacuum to pumps, but because there's no friction, the only thing is air friction. You put it in a vacuum tube, no friction at all. That would be a pretty neat way of transportation. You just want to make sure you have good brakes, because if there's no friction, like okay, that thing is a, that's what I am. That thing is not is not going to end well otherwise. Yeah, but I would really think about it. Okay, transportation is really what I um, think it could be really really a game changer. So. For transportation, electric cars, okay, so that seems to be, right, plays an important point, but how do we get to net zero? Airplanes is a, airplanes is a problem. Like airplanes and also heavy um, yeah, trucks, it's not that simple. Like for trucks, at some point your uh, battery is just taking too much weight, which is not hanging. So there, you need to look for other options. Room temperature superconductivity could be a real game changer. So basically, you have a motor which is based on a room temperature electromagnet. You, transatlantic or uh, transcontinental flights could become possible with that. So yeah, that could be a real game changer. OK, so um, so far, everything I've talked about here is what we call DC superconductivity. What, what is the DC current? Basically, DC current is something, OK, I put a current along here. Yeah, and it always will flow in the same direction. Yeah. Is this what we use in households? Do we have DC? No, we have AC currents, right? 60 hertz, so what does it mean? That means that the direction of the current changes 60 times in one second. OK? Sure, fair enough. OK, we're used to that. OK, so what I'll be working on is Uh, with these guys. So this is a uh, superconducting radio frequency cavity. All right, so it's fancy, I guess. So this one changes the direction of the magnet, um, of the current, where the current flows. And the electric field is what we need. This is kind of like what is we use for to accelerate particles. And this changes three billion times per second, the direction. OK, 3 billion times. So why do we need to change it so often? So this is what actually increases energy of part of the particles in an accelerator. So we have this. This is an actual prototype. Yeah. So this is an actual prototype, uh, which I got from uh, my previous employer, OK, with it soon, Switzerland. And um, so the idea is that. So the particle comes here, sees an electric field pointing that way. So the electric field has to point in the same direction as the particle is traveling. So it's basically an energy transformer. In that way, it can gain energy. But if it would go the other way around, it would lose energy. So it comes here. Oh, OK, it flows the right way. But it has to arrive here. Basically, there's no field here and here. No field here and here, only in that part there. So it has to be able to travel from here to here before the field changes direction. That's 3 billion. Uh, in the end of the day, OK, that's um, uh, one divided by three billion of a second. This is how long it takes. Because the particles are traveling very, very close to the speed of light in there. Okay, so this is a superconductor. This is niobium. All right, I'm a superconductor which has discovered, it has been discovered in 1920. And we still use that. This is what we use in all particle accelerators which use this technology. We use it as a Triumph, uh, which is a lab around UBC campus. Um, yeah, but, um, they pay half of my salary, so I go from time to time. 
And yeah, and we use this also, for example, in the largest particle accelerator at CERN, or we built like we built 27 kilometer rings where, okay, a couple of those, or like linear accelerators, basically the accelerators which are just three kilometers of those. One after the other, so each one is um, getting up. Okay, so how good are these? So unfortunately, it's because this is an AC current, you don't get zero resistance. So these things are going to, and you're going to heat up, no matter what, there's no way out of that, unfortunately. But yeah, how good can we be? So actually, we are a million times better than if we use copper. So what we define there is what's called what's called a quality factor, and this basically tells me. This is, I got to give it to technically here, but I mean, in the end of the day, what it is is how many oscillations does the thing undergo before it loses all its energy? Yeah, and that's a million times a million can the thing do. Roughly, okay, it's pretty good. It's actually the best oscillating systems in the world. If you compare that, it's also an um, acoustic resonator. All right, so it's basically also an acoustic resonator, or is at least we use it for electromagnetic waves. So let's imagine it would be as good for acoustic waves as it um, would be for electromagnetic waves. So that would mean I hit it like that and we could come here next year. At the same time you would still hear it. So that's how good they are. In yeah. So if we put it in perspective like okay another oscillation system pendulum or a swing. Well, so think about like it would be a swing if a swing would be so good. Okay so you could put um, uh, your, your kit um, uh, on, on the swing. I also a dad, so, and then, okay, I think like, okay, I put my kid on the swing. There you go, and so how long would it swing? I mean, do I have time, like, here to go over, oh, get my drink, drink my drink? Yeah, have time for that, yeah. So, <laughs> when would the swing come to stop? Well, 50, 60 years later. So, like, um, that's plenty of time. So, this is basically how good these devices are. But, uh, and we are still limited here to materials, which are niobium. We don't get these somewhat fancy. Basically, it's three types. I mean, okay, there's the elements. Then I got my, I lost my wire. You saw it. Uh, these are the ones like the compounds, and then the really fancy ones, the high temperature ones. Okay, we are using basically the first generation still. So what is that? What is the reason for that? Because if I don't have a DC current, uh, AC time changing current, then the superconductor really doesn't like magnetic field. Like for the other one, okay, sure, under DC currents, they found a way to coexist. No, 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 under AC, they don't like it. Not at all. This is basically, and um, yeah, my research is really about trying to find a way so that the magnetic fields and the superconductors get a little bit better along in the AC regime. So as you could trying to get materials in which are discovered in 1950, 1960, but we cannot just use them as, as, as they are. So what we basically do, we have to do it in very, very thin layers. So a couple of atoms only at a time and make it very clean, get it inside. And that could be a game changer in that um, in regards that we don't need to build an accelerator 10 kilometers long. I mean, uh, in the ideal case, maybe five. If you got a factor of two, two. Because the magnetic field I can get in this one is a factor of 100 less than what you get in a wire. It's my research about. I mean, it's a factor of 100, which um, uh, potentially is available. Make particle accelerator smaller, makes it more efficient. This is what I do for a living. All right, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. All right, thank you, Toby. Um, Toby is very happy to take questions now, so please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. I'm going to repeat your question um, so the, pe the people on the live stream can hear it okay. I got a yeah, please. So the question is, with a room temperature superconductor, it sounds like you've got a perpetual motion machine. Does that not break one of the laws of thermodynamics? <laughs> 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 
It's a good question. Uh, it's a good question. Um, well, I mean, it doesn't create energy out of nothing. I mean, it just doesn't lose any. So in a sense, like um, I think thermodynamics allows you not to lose energy. It just says, okay, basically, just it does not create energy out of nothing. So it's not. Could you make? Um, um, you got a constant magnetic field in the end of the day if you have that. Yeah, but I mean, there's a permanent magnet does this already. It's not really motion involved, right? I mean, that's okay if you look at the current itself. But yeah, um, look at the electrons. Yeah. I never saw it that way. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, it doesn't create energy out of nothing. I think I would be probably my, uh, I guess, this, I go with that. <laughs> Just as a yes, good Um, what, what is what is the nature of the attractive force between the electrons at very low temperature? So it's not a fundamental force. So um, uh, you mentioned like okay, the fund uh, fundamental force, electromagnetic, is a strong force, a weak force. Okay, so you said okay. In the end of the day, what is happening? It is it is, that is the electromagnetic force which is relevant for that. But what it is, uh, you kind of have to think about that. You have all the atoms inside your material, and then. Like the first electron pushes them away, yeah, it deforms the lattice, and here, here the cold temperature comes in. So if it is not moving fast, it stays there for a bit. The deformation, right at a high temperature, which just moved back, but it stays for a bit, and then the second electron sees it. Aha! There's a way where I can lower my energy. Now it's going there where it's basically not so much repelled, so it can easier move to there, and this creates the attractive, the attractive force. Question at the back? Yes, please. Can you expand on the mechanism of the attraction between the electrons? Okay, so the attraction goes through the, in that case, okay, I think I have to explain that, it basically goes through the deformation of the lattice, so you know, the energy, but why, why do you think, like, why you get zero resistance was probably the question, why does it lead to resistance? Right, okay, so because that creates an attractive force between those, so basically you need to break them apart to scatter, okay? So, but the binding is so strong, strong enough, so that scattering does not break it apart. And therefore, I go and scatter, they can't lose energy. The energy they would lose in a certain one is not enough to break them apart. So there is, for these, we call Cooper pairs, there is no way for them to lose energy through the normal process of scattering. So be, are you imagining the, for a room temperature superconductor that there'd be an entirely new mechanism for superconductivity? Because presumably mm -hmm. the theorists have looked at Cooper <coughs> pairs and know what, temp the, what the temperature limit is there. Well, I, <laughs> okay, so the mechanism is very well understood like for those lower temperature superconductors. Um, we know, we don't really understand for the higher temperature superconductor what's happening. We know, yes, so electrons pair in a way, but it's not through the it's not through the lattice or through the material around them itself. You know that, like certain experiments would tell you that. You change material a little bit and you would expect some things to see. So we know that it's different, but I don't really know what exactly it is. So yes, it will be a different mechanism that seems to be Pretty sure. So, like, when we say like conventional things, okay, we get up to 40 degrees above absolute zero. Like all the other ones, they seem to have a different mechanism, yes. But the end of the attraction between the electrons is the way how they do it will be different. I think it will be still the, um, yeah, so like the attraction between electrons is just a different way how it's done. So, if you can dream up an explanation for. Even ceramic superconductivity, there's a Nobel Prize waiting out there for someone. Any other questions?
Yeah, please. What do you think the role of machine learning is going to be in finding the exact deleted bits? What do you think is the role of machine learning in helping us find better superconductors? Yeah, Spoke, I guess spoken like a trendy chemist. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I I think I get everything. I could see that even machine learning on a quantum computer. Because okay, I guess quantum systems are probably easily um, modeled on yeah, quantum computers. I could see that, yeah. I mean, honestly, what I think is right now a lot, a lot is we try. Yeah, we try one more year for another one, and then, okay, something happened. But I think that things should be certainly hopefully informed by theory. That people may have been with machine learning. Yeah, certainly. I could definitely see that um, uh, these things kind of, maybe that's a, maybe that's a game changer. Well, yeah, speculation. Yeah, certainly exploring chemical space is vast, right? So any, anything you can do to accelerate that process is going to be helpful. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, Toby suggested we were a bit of a pessimistic group. <laughs> Has, in the time he's been working and being, forgive me, the younger person on stage, if presumably not, has he seen enough development, both in understanding and uh, kind of practical implementation, to make him an optimist? Have Have you seen in the la in, in over your career enough movement in the field to make you think that the dean of science, who predicted that we would have room con room temperature superconductivity in fifteen years, is he being realistic, or does he just have ridiculously high expectations? I have ridiculously high expectations. <laughs> Well, I guess as a dean of science, he probably wants to have high expectation to get things um, moving and to put a little bit of pressure on um, uh, people. Um, yeah, I mean, 15 years. Uh, I, we don't know when it's going. But when is it going to happen? And um, did I see the progress? I don't really. As I said, I mean, I work on materials which are discovered in um, 100 years ago. And okay, like my okay, I think I'm hoping to bring materials from 1950s, 1950s, 1960s to my field of the AC superconductivity. So it's a little bit, um, yeah. So progress is often slow here. I definitely say that, but I think that is probably not gradual. So I think it's it's going to happen or not. We can't really predict it. So like, okay, somebody might just out of luck, or well, I mean. Being informed by the right thing, maybe a, maybe a theory a theory has a breakthrough and can predict it better. Yeah, but I mean, like giving a prediction is very is very hard. It could happen, or well, maybe not. Maybe it's not even possible. I don't know. We don't know. But I mean, what I think is where we are, like minus one hundred thirty five degrees Celsius right now. Sure, I mean, okay, that's not warm, but it's not okay. But it's far away from absolute zero. It's halfway, roughly, huh? Halfway, and it's nothing. I don't think it is um, a very, very special that number. Yeah, I come back like, okay, so, I just simply why not? Yeah, I don't think there's anything special about uh, that specific number. Speaking as someone who's a bit older than Toby, I remember I was 14 years old in 1986 oh. when um, superconductivity. Um, was announced and the development was astonishing in those early days because the first ceramic superconductor superconducted at a temperature below that of liquid nitrogen. But it was only like three years later or even less that they came up with ones that would superconduct at temperatures um, above liquid nitrogen temperature. And that, even that is a really dramatic breakthrough because it would make an MRI machine, which Toby talked about, most of the size of an MRI machine is insulation to keep the liquid helium cold. You could probably have a MRI machine in every, every doctor's office if it just used liquid nitrogen, right? Yeah, well, they're definitely when you have room temperature superconductivity, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So the, qu the question is, um, what is the field strength of a superconducting magnet, like in an MRI machine? Uh, an MRI machine? Uh, I think it's like six, seven tes Tesla. Is that the one that everybody's... 
so six, seven Tesla is a typical uh, one. You can go up to, well, 20 or so, you can, it's, um, yeah, it depends a little bit on the design. So for example, the LHC and the particle accelerators, it can go also six, seven, similar to MRI machine. Depends a little bit of what type of magnets um, uh, you'll be using. Well, that's a ballpark. 100 milli Tesla. A tenth of a Tesla is basically what these guys can do. Well. All right. Well, thank you for your attendance tonight and your questions. And please join with me in thanking Toby for a great talk.